Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Jai, Jai Guru. Guru. Welcome to our autobiography of a yogi class. Today we're starting with chapter 32. This is Rama is raised from the dead. So let's find out if we might, <laughs> if we figure out the technique of raising people from the dead, or we only get to learn a little bit about our own immortality, <laughs> our own mortality. <laughs> We want to say the words. The words to this <laughs> chant that we're going to do is fill my body, fill my spirit, fill me with the sound of Om. So as we sing this, let's try to feel that that same healing power that we'll be reading about and uh, discussing today. Let's already start filling that energy in our being.
Let's continue to ask <coughs> to the universe, to the divine, to the gurus, to fill us with a consciousness of expansion, of well-being, of perfect balance, of kindness, and love for one another. And only when we feel we have been filled with that consciousness, Let's invite the presence of the great ones who will guide this class and will help us understand deeper aspects of the life of these great saints that we are about to study. Let's invoke the presence of Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and Paramahansa Yogananda. Open our hearts and our minds so we can receive your darshan in the form of lessons, greater insights, and deeper wisdom on how we can live our lives. Om Shanti Shanti. <coughs> if you're following along with the book, let's turn to chapter 32. This is page 282. Rama is raised from the dead. <coughs> now a certain man was sick named Lazarus. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. What does that mean? This is a beautiful story. Mm. And it's how Yogananda is choosing to start this chapter because it parallels exactly what we will now see Lahiri Mahashaya and Sri Yukteswar kind of do together or experience. Um, in the story of the Bible, there was a man named Lazarus. He was a disciple of, Para of not Paramahans Yogananda, although he could have been, who knows, a disciple of Jesus. And two of his sisters were Mary and Martha, also very, very close. Mary Magdalene, very close disciples. Now, Lazarus, suddenly news travels to Christ that Lazarus is unwell and he's sick a little like a village or two away and Christ says you know nothing's gonna happen and these people are saying come we know if you can come if you just touch him if you're just there he will be healed and Christ refuses to go he just says these particular words that the sickness is not unto death but for the glory of God that the Son of God might be glorified 
thereby. So he's not doing anything. This guy is sick, a close disciple of his, and Martha and Mary travel to him and they're saying, Lord, please, you know, my brother, he's just about to die. Why aren't you coming? And Christ, for some weird reason, just refuses to go. In the past, they've seen him travel, you know, instantly when some random person is not feeling so good and Christ would say, let's go to this person, but here somebody really close to him. And then news comes that Lazarus is dead. He died and so now everybody's like, well, okay, it's over. Now Christ says, chalo, now let's go. And he walks and it's a three day journey to, you know, so he's dead. He's already been, you know, uh, yeah. put into those wrapped into the in the Jewish tradition, into the shroud. He's already been put into a little grotto, a cave, the huge stones. That's how the bodies in the Judaic tradition are interred. You know, this huge stone is then placed before that grotto and sealed there. Now Christ says, now let's do something. So he goes there. He's in front of the grotto. He tells everybody, remove this stone. And in the, in the Bible, it's like kind of comical. <laughs> the disciples tell him, but Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's been three days. His body is already decaying. <laughs> you know, let's not open this rock by any chance. And Christ, of course, asks them to do so. And then he says, Lazarus, rise and walk forward. And Lazarus comes all completely tied up in the shrouds. And so that's what this means. Sometimes these great masters, you don't know what they're really trying to do. Because for us, our mortality is such a finite, such a fixed reality. Of course, it's not doesn't mean Christ was going around raising every person from the dead. It doesn't mean we need to be raised from the dead at all. But it does mean that the power of God, if it were kind of to choose to flow, has absolutely no limit. And I love over here Christ kind of just immediately declaring this sickness has nothing to do with death. It is going to be created so that generations later, years later, millennia later, everyone will remember this moment. Because if I had healed him when he was just sick, people would say, oh wow, isn't that lovely? You know, he got healed. But imagine if I had to raise somebody from the dead, then people will know what true power is. Until today, the story of Lazarus is a reminder for all of us. And now we continue and see how that story is replicated to a certain degree in the life of, of Lahiri Mahashaya. Sri Yukteswar, now this is another interesting part. What we just read was Sri Yukteswar was expounding the Christian scriptures one sunny morning on the balcony of his Serampur hermitage. You know, I've read this book so many times, but it never struck me that Sri Yukteswar was also constantly sharing from the Bible mm -hmm. as one of the scriptures that he was teaching all his yeah. disciples. I mean, we know that kind of vaguely in our mind that Babaji really wanted, you know, Christianity and the true teachings of Christ to be shared. But here Sri Yukteswar is kind of as a daily practice in their ashram, expounding from the Bible. Besides a few of Master's other disciples, I was present with a small group of my Ranchi students. In this passage, Jesus calls himself the Son of God. Though he was truly united with God, his reference here has a deep impersonal significance, my Guru explained. The Son of God is the Christ or divine consciousness in man. No mortal can glorify God. The only honor that man can pay his creator is to seek him. Man cannot glorify an abstraction that he does not know. Isn't that beautiful? Hum jitna bhi, we can go around worshipping, oh Bhagwan, oh Krishna, oh Vishnu, oh whoever. But Christ or Sri Yukteswar is saying, man cannot glorify an abstraction that he does not know. Until we've not actually assumed the consciousness of these great ones, of Krishna, of whoever, there's, you can't speak of them because everything else is just, you know, just made up. We're just making stuff up based on something that somebody has told us about Krishna's life, about Ram's life, about who Vishnu was, but they're just abstractions in our minds. The glory or nimbus, which is what you see around saints, you know, that halo of sorts. The glory of limbus or nimbus around the head of saints is a symbolic witness 
of their capacity to render divine homage. So that's what that represents, that they know God enough to truly talk of Him, to worship Him, to glorify Him, to really when they say God is this, they're not just saying it out of something they've read, they're not saying it because somebody told them that, because they experience God as bliss. They're experiencing God as that freedom. Master said, no, that saints are the custodians the of true, true custodians the of true custodians of religions. That's such a wonderful um, concept, no? that it's not the church, it's not the temple, it's not the pujaris, it's only the saints who have had that experience of God. And what's lovely over here is, as we come back to that um, saying by Christ, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are familiar with the Bible, you'll see Christ refers to himself in two different ways. Sometimes he refers to himself as the Son of Man, and sometimes he'll refer to himself as the Son of God. And Master would talk about the Son of Man is Christ the human. The Son of Man has to eat, the Son of Man has to move, the Son of Man has to, you know, laugh, the Son of Man has to sleep, whatever it is. But the Son of God, which is what uh, Sri Yukteswar is saying, is that Christ consciousness or the divine consciousness inside us. That's what we're trying to glorify. Not that Jesus Christ may be glorified, because Jesus Christ in that particular incarnation was the Son of Man as a body, as a reality. But the divine consciousness that he represented, that all of us represent, is the Son of God inside us. We can become the children of God if we understand who God is. And that's what Sri Yukteswar is trying for us to kind of encourage us to want to truly know God rather than only glorify him, worship him and hope that in some words we are able to find or glimpse truth without needing to put out the effort to truly experience that truth. Sri Yukteswar went on to read the marvelous story of Lazarus' resurrection. At its conclusion, Master fell into a long silence. The sacred book opened on his knee. I too was privileged to behold a similar miracle. My guru finally spoke with solemn unction. Lahiri Mahashaya resurrected one of my friends from the dead. The young lads at my side smiled with keen interest and there was enough of the boy in me too to enjoy not only the philosophy but in particular any story I could get Sri Yukteswar to relate about his wondrous experiences with his guru. It's an interesting thing that Yogananda was with Sri Yukteswar for so long yeah. and he hadn't heard this story because it shows a certain side of Sri Yukteswar which was mostly silent. <laughs> Sri Yukteswar wasn't a very <laughs> chatty, <Yeah>. cafe <laughs> person. It's like, and should I tell you, my guru ne aur kya kiya tha? Aur main batau tujhe, main ne kya dekha tha? You know, none of that. Only when that right moment, oh, since we're talking about Lazarus, let me, you know, imagine 14 years of being with his guru not, and he hadn't heard this story before. So it just, again, shows you a certain side of Sri Yukteswar's where he wasn't uh, that constantly sharing from the outward level and that Yogananda's relationship to him was primarily within from a perspective of attunement. It shows a little bit also even uh, Yogananda's respect towards Sri Yudeshwar's um, silence. And mm. it, it seems through this paragraph that Yogananda wasn't always demanding from Sri Yukteswar uh, wisdom or knowledge or tell me this story or tell me about that. It's like it, it feels and I appreciate that so much from the perspective of a disciple. When, when you respect uh, the Guru to give you or, or to refrain information from you and, and allow him to give you when he feels you are ready to absorb or to do something with it. And, and I love the fact that here, you know, you can sense Yogananda, wow, my guru <laughs> is about to say something really, really special. And he was like all his senses in alert. But otherwise, if 
his Ryutesh war didn't share anything. Yogananda just kept going with his business, his own inner ability to relate to Sri Yudeshwar in a much more inward state. My friend Rama and I were inseparable, Master began. Because he was shy and reclusive, he chose to visit our Guru, Lahiri Mahashaya, only during the hours of midnight and dawn, when the crowd of daytime disciples was absent. As Rama's closest friend, I served as a spiritual vent through which he let out the wealth of his spiritual perceptions. I found inspiration in his ideal companionship. My guru's face softened with memories. Rama was suddenly put to a severe test. He contracted the disease of Asiatic cholera. As our master never objected <coughs> excuse me, to the services of physicians at the time of serious illness, Two specialists were summoned. Amidst the frantic rush of ministering to the stricken man, I was deeply praying to Lahiri Mahashaya for help. I hurried to his home and sobbed out the story. The doctors are seeing Rama. He will be well. My guru smiled jovially. I returned with a light heart to my friend's bedside, only to find him in a dying state. He cannot last more than one or two hours. One of the physicians told me with a gesture of despair. Once more, I hastened to Lahiri Mahashaya. The doctors are conscientious men. I am sure Rama will be well. The master dismissed me blithely. At Rama's place, I found both doctors gone. One had left me a note. We have done our best but his case is hopeless. My friend was indeed the picture of a dying man. I did not understand how Lehri Mahashaya's words could fail to come true, yet the sight of Rama's rapidly ebbing life kept suggesting to my mind, all is over now. Tossing thus on the seas of faith and apprehensive doubt, I ministered to my friend as best I could. He roused himself to cry out, Yukteswar, run to master and tell him I am gone. Ask him to bless my body before its last rites. With these words, Rama sighed heavily and gave up the ghost. I wept for an hour by his beloved form. That suggests such a sweet friendship must mm -hmm. have existed between the two. And even when he talks about just that ideal companionship, mm -hmm. you know, that's the kind of friends we should be looking for in this life. I think he and Sri Yuteshwar's personality matched so well, yeah. like very you know, introverted. yeah. Always a lover of quiet, now he, ca he had attained the utter stillness of death. Another disciple came in and I asked him to remain in the house until I returned. Half dazed, I trudged back to my guru. How is Rama now? Lehri Mahashaya's face was wreathed in smiles. So Lehri Mahashaya is enjoying himself. He doesn't seem to be affected at all by what's going on. Sir, you will, feel, you will soon see how he is. I blurted out emotionally. In a few hours, you will see his body before it is carried to the, to the crematory grounds. I broke down and moaned openly. Yukteswar, control yourself. Sit calmly and meditate. My guru retired into samadhi. The afternoon and night passed in unbroken silence. I struggled unsuccessfully to regain an inner composure. At dawn, Lahiri Mahashaya glanced at me consolingly. I see you are still disturbed. Why didn't you explain yesterday that you expected me to give Rama tangible aid in the form of some medicine? The master pointed to a cup-shaped lamp containing crude castor oil. Fill a little bottle from the lamp and put seven drops into Rama's mouth. Sir, I remonstrated, he has been dead since yesterday noon. Of what use is the oil now? 
Never mind, you do as I ask. Lahiri Mahashaya's cheerful mood was incomprehensible. I was still in the unassaged agony of bereavement. Pouring out a small amount of oil, I departed for Rama's house. I found my book friend's body rigid in the death clasp. Paying no attention to his ghastly condition, I opened his lips with my right finger and managed with my left hand and the help of the cock to put the oil drop by drop over his clenched teeth. As the seventh drop touched his cold lips, Rama shivered violently. His muscles vibrated from head to toe and he sat up wonderingly. <laughs> I saw Lahiri Mahashaya in a blaze of light, he cried. He shone like the sun. Arise, forsake your sleep, he commanded me. Come with, Shri, come with Yukteswar to see me. So here we are. <laughs> this really crazy story. When we first read stories like this, our mind says, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know if this can happen. And a part of our mind says, boy, I wish it could happen with me. <laughs> you know, we've got this dual personality that first rejects anything that is a little beyond our own experience. But at the same time, you know, the, the FOMO <laughs> comes in like, Mere bhi hona aisa, you know, one day I also want to have these kind of experiences. But of course, you have to be kind of Sri Yukteswar or Rama to really attract such an experience in our lives. But it's interesting over here, this whole process. Because I think the key ingredient here, of course, was Sri Yukteswar's faith. And of course, in, to a certain degree, the lack of his faith. Mm -hmm. This line right here is, Lahiri Mahashaya's, I could not understand how Lahiri Mahashaya's words could fail to come true. So on one hand, Sri Yukteswar really had that understanding that Lahiri Mahashaya ne bol diya hai to bas, you know, nothing should go wrong. And that was a strong kind of anchor for him. Yet the sight of Rama's rapidly ebbing life kept suggesting to my mind, all is over now. And yet there was this other thought that superseded and was stronger based on what we see in front of us. Isn't that how it happens with our, in our lives? We are very much like, oh, I have so much faith in my guru. Oh, mere saath kuch galat ho hi nahi sakta hai. And then the first thing that starts going wrong in our mind, suddenly we're unable to remember that faith. Suddenly it's like, oh, maybe in this particular case, my guru is not going to be here with me or this seems to be wrong or this can't be right. And it's very hard for us to hold true faith. And Sri Yukteswar, of course, probably just playing some little game here of, you know, the Leela of trying to just demonstrate to us these two flows. I mean, if somebody told you, Mene bol diya, he's going to be fine. You see somebody dying. I mean, there's hardly any chance that we'll truly believe them. Then we might say, okay, but if my guru told me or if I had some intuitive understanding, maybe I would have more faith. But we never really demonstrate that faith in our daily lives as much. In our daily lives, anytime something goes a little wrong, suddenly our heart, you know, clenches. Suddenly we feel that we have to take control of this situation. Suddenly we look to outward tangible realities and we say, Yaha agar theek nahi hai, how can it ever be right? And that's the kind of game that Sri Yukteswar was kind of playing in his mind, playing in his consciousness. What is true faith? And where does doubt play a role? Because our doubts are primarily by what we see are happening. My life is not going in accordance to how I think it should. And instantly that doubt comes in that something's not right here. You know, <laughs> in this particular case, the grace is not with me. But grace is in essence always with us. Now, similar to the Lazarus story, Lahiri Mahashaya just waited. Rama could have been healed at that very moment, had Sri Yukteswar's faith been crystal clear? Oh, okay, done. Doctors could have said, oh no, he's about to die. And Sri Yukteswar could say, no, that's not going to happen. And the doctor said, no, 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 I give him one or two hours. And Sri Yukteswar could say, nope. 
But every time the doctor said one hour, two hour, he's about to die, Sri Yukteswar was pulled out of that, you know, centeredness of, no, my guru has said this. And that's what happens again in our lives. And so Lahiri Masha just let the whole process ki, theek hai, jab tak you don't get to that absolute understanding, I let this whole game play out to the point that he allows Rama to even pass away. Just like Christ allowed Lazarus, theek hai? Let it go. Now that he's died, chalo, now let's walk towards him. Similarly, now that he's died, now that Sri Yukteswar is so shaken, you know, sometimes in our absolute lowest moments, we are most open to the Guru because it's in that time we can just surrender completely. There's nothing left in us. We've wept, we've let it all go. There's just nothing left. No more resistance left in us at all. So it's almost like Lahiri Masha had to let Sri Yukteswar get to that moment before he could then say, now come, now meditate with me, now sit here and let's just get into that stillness. Which it wasn't like Sri Yukteswar could get into that stillness. But there he was trying his best to regain that inner connection. And then of course, then Lahiri Masha says, take this oil, you know, let me give you something that you can relate to, something tangible, something that you feel. That's how, you know, we're like so trained by the material world that way. Oh, this medicine will fix it all. Or this prescription will, you know, finally cure all the problems that I have. This surgery will do it for me, so on and so forth. And of course, oftentimes they can and oftentimes it is a lot of our mind supporting that surgery and that medicine and you know that prescription saying this will this will make me well and then it allows us the test that they do when they're uh, you know trying to introduce a drug into the market they do these tests which uh, call about based on the placebo effect you know they'll give a sugar pill to one control group and they'll give the actual medicine to another control group and weirdly they'll find people getting well on both sides of those groups because even with just that sugar pill if somebody convinces that i have got the real medicine they start to heal themselves of any infirmity so here they are suddenly rama awakens you have anything to add before? i was i was thinking that you know just pause for a moment what that experience might have brought to Sri Uteshwar as disciple. I mean, to the point that after that, how could I ever doubt of my Guru's guidance? And this is what happens, and we need to go through each one of us as disciples. Sometimes we have to doubt the Guru so badly and, and also recognize that we are not able to take our Guru's word 100% and to fail in something. And then the Guru performs that miracle when, when we really can't recognize that the Guru has always been there by our size, our size. And what we need to really gain above anything is the experience and, this con and the consciousness that I will never ever doubt my Guru's ways to teach me a lesson. And once we come to that inner understanding Anything that comes to us comes with the knowing and the trust. This is what my guru thinks I need. And then life becomes meaningful and purposeful. And absolutely every test comes to take us to our next level of in this particular case of discipleship i have the strong feeling that after <coughs> that this created a turning point between sri yudeshwar and lahiri mahashaya's relationship between guru and disciple after this how could we ever doubt the guru's words 
ever. And that's the point that eventually uh, all of us will need to arrive. <clears throat> I could scarcely believe my eyes when Rama dressed himself. He's just been dead. Now he's up and he's already putting his clothes on and was strong enough after that fatal sickness to walk to the home of our Guru. There he prostrated himself before Lehri Mahashaya with tears of gratitude. The master was beside himself with mirth. His eyes twinkled at me mischievously. <laughs> like Lehri Masha is oblivious to this, you know, completely heart-wrenching experience Sri Yukteswar has gone through. I mean, in that bliss, it's like he's just trying Sri Yukteswar to understand that God's power, that the consciousness that we are trying to achieve, there is no death, there is no sorrow, there is no sickness, there is no suffering. And it's just a very, very hard lesson for all of us to learn. We are so obsessed with our bodies, aren't we? When everything is fine with the body, nah, we don't give it one moment of a thought. The moment something goes wrong with our body, my goodness, our life becomes just a living hell of sorts and we're just obsessed and then everything just becomes about how to get the body to feel better. And here, this guy going through letting go completely of the body and then being drawn back into it through Lahiri Masha's power. Yukteswar, he said, surely henceforth you will not fail to carry with you a bottle of castor oil. <laughs> Whenever you see a corpse, just administer the oil. Why, seven drops of lamp oil must surely foil the power of Yama. Guruji, you are ridiculing me, but I don't understand. Please point out the nature of my error. One thing here is just very sweet. Is Sri Yukteswar instantly wanting to know what he did wrong? Mm. If my guru said to me and started making fun of me like this, I would be very hurt. I'd probably be, get really moody. I'd probably like go and sulk in a corner somewhere, you know. And for days, I'd be like, "Ki, maine kya galat kiya? Maine to kuch galat kiya hi nahi tha. Maine to, you know, I was, I was really caring about Rama all the time. And why is my, you know, why is this person being this way?" Sri Yukteswar ka immediately. What did I do wrong? Help me understand. Because that's all I really want from you. I'm not here. I don't even, I wasn't even looking for healing. I just wanted for you to help me understand what this situation really was about. I told you twice that Rama would be well. Yet you could not fully believe me. You see, this is where the Guru's subtle reality comes in because Bahar Bahar said to Sri Yukteswar was sounding like he believes him fully. <laughs> oh, Guru, okay, okay, you have told me, let's go, I'm out of here. But that's the thing, Bahar Bahar said to we all look like the ideal disciples. Bahar Bahar said to we all can hold, you know, smiles and loving faces for a little while, while the situation calls for it. But the Guru is not interested in Bahar Bahar say, what you say, what you do, what you demonstrate to others. He knew and he could feel inside that Sri Yukteswar was not fully convinced. And he was waiting that his Guru would give him something, would do something. Oh, oh Rama is unwell. Okay, okay, okay. Um, you know, like that's what we want. Oh, Rama is unwell. Om karte hai, ab Rama well ho jayega. Not that he'll be fine. And then he's, you know, just ready to do whatever he needs to. So, you did not fully believe me. I did not mean that the doctors would be able to cure him. I remarked only that they were in attendance. Because that's what he said very casually, you know. The doctors are there, he will be well. Oh, the doctors are really conscientious, I'm sure he'll be fine. So, he said those two lines where Sri Yukteswar assumed that it'll, the healing will come through the doctors. But here he says, there was no casual connection between my two statements or well, not casual causal sorry that's more appropriate there was no causal connection between my two statements i didn't want to interfere with the physicians they too have to live in a voice resounding with joy my guru added 
Always know that the inexhaustible Paramatman can heal anyone, doctor or no doctor. And this is a reality that at some point each of us will have to arrive at. You know, not about doctors or no doctors, as the um, Masha is saying here, that if healing is needed, if healing is necessary, there is no power that can stop healing from happening. But is healing always necessary? Is healing always needed? Is the real question. Just because I'm going through pain doesn't mean that I shouldn't go through pain. Doesn't mean my pain should stop. But we believe very deeply that if I'm suffering, I shouldn't suffer. Suffering should end instantly. I should be fine always. But that's just never going to be the case. And that's the faith that we are trying to develop. Not so much that my guru will heal me. So much to say is, if healing is needed, healing will happen. And that's the harder faith to develop because we believe very strongly healing should happen. And we've got all these healing modalities out there today, you know, every kind in the world. And all of them keep affirming to us that if you just learn this one technique, you know, healing will happen instantly because this one guy did it. If we were to believe that Lahiri Mahashaya could heal this man from the dead, so then we should just learn this technique and we will also be able to heal people from the dead. But that's not going to happen. Just as Christ was not going randomly around and saying, Oh, you died, you died, you died, you died, Because that's not the point of death, is it? And similarly, that's not the point of any sickness. Healing is the realization that God is the only reality. And if my body has to go through some tapasya to help me awaken to that truth, then so be it. Then that tapasya is what I need. And so each of us have to really get comfortable with sickness, get very comfortable with discomfort, with dis-ease, with difficulties and pain and suffering. When we get comfortable with that reality, only then will we not be swayed by health or by sickness. <clears throat> I see my mistake, I acknowledged remorsefully. I know now that your simple word is binding on the whole cosmos. Now Sri Yukteswar knows and never again will he doubt. Lahiri Mahasaya ne bol diya to bol diya And this is an important thing for us. We don't have a guru in the body. You know, we're not going to run to Yogananda and say, Oh, you know, my friend is unwell and when are you going to heal him? He's not going to necessarily say anything. But he said so many other things to us that we don't fully believe. You can become a Jeevan Mukta in this lifetime. <laughs> we don't fully believe it because we don't act that way. Two hours of Hongsa will make you a master. We don't do it. Keep your attention at the spiritual eye at all times and within 24 hours you could have God if you do that. We still don't do it. We don't do it because we don't believe it entirely. And that's our level of faith. And it's going to take us to suffer before we fully accept that as true. Just as Sri Yukteswar had to go through this extremely difficult situation. Rama was like not even bothered. Tell Lahiri Mahashaya just to bless my body before I die. You know, he was like, he was less bothered than Sri Yukteswar. And Sri Yukteswar had to go through that really difficult moment so that he could awaken in faith. And each of us go through very difficult moments only so that we can awaken in faith. Moving on. Mm -hmm. Sri Yukteswar dismissed the little group and motioned me to a blanket seat at his feet. Yogananda, he said with unusual gravity, you have been surrounded from birth by direct disciples of Lahiri Mahashaya. How many disciples have we seen of Lahiri Mahashaya that have been in Yogananda's life? His father, his mother, his, mother, his Sanskrit tutor, Pranabhananda, 
Ram Gopal Mazumdar, his guru. Mm. I mean, everybody is just disciples of Lahiri Masha. Everyone in his life have just been disciples of Lahiri Masha. In that sense, Lahiri Masha, um, I don't know when, if Swami said this or somebody pointed it out that Master once mentioned that Sri Yukteswar was his physical guru or mm -hmm. guru on this earth. Lahiri Mahasaya okay. was his astral, astral guru, guru and, and Babaji, Babaji was, was his, his causal, causal guru. guru. Yeah. Because we have to keep a setting. Like right now Sri Yukteswar says, I'm in Hiranyaloka helping those in the astral world to move into the causal world. So for those people, Sri Yukteswar is now acting as an astral guru to help them move in that level. So, hmm. of course, Lahiri Mahasaya has played a key role from in his freedom on the astral level and once again, that energy continues even in this lifetime. The great master lived his sublime life in partial seclusion and steadfastly refused to permit his followers to build any organization around his teachings. He made nevertheless a significant prediction. This is Lahiri Mahasaya. About 50 years after my passing, he said, my life will be written my life will be written because of a deep interest in yoga, which the West will manifest. The yogic message will encircle the globe and aid in establishing that brotherhood of man, which results from direct perception of the one father. My son, Yogananda, Sri Yukteswar went on, you must do your part in spreading that message and in writing that sacred life. 50 years after Lahiri Mahasaya's passing in 1895, culminated in 1945, the year of completion of this present book. I cannot but be struck by the coincidence that the year 1945 has also ushered in a new age, the era of revolutionary atomic energies. All thoughtful minds turn as never before to the urgent problems of peace and brotherhood, lest the continued use of physical force banish all men along with their problems. What was 1945 famous for? What, what was when the atomic bomb was dropped. So that was the first time we used the power of the atom to demonstrate how much energy is, you know, held in that. And of course, as Lahiri Mahasaya was saying, interestingly, he told none of his disciples and he says, you don't write about my life. I don't want you guys to be building any organization around me because 50 years from now, from the West, there will be an interest that will be developed. And at that time, people will hear and read about my life. Such an interesting way for him to go about it. On one hand, when you read this, you're like, oh he's, such a, oh, he's such a humble, great master. Oh, he doesn't want anything. You know how we think about people. Oh, they don't want an organization around them. There must be really good gurus and he must be the real thing. But let Shri Yogananda was responsible for going and creating an entire work, an entire organization, just so that Lahiri Mahasaya's teachings could be known. Lahiri Mahasaya knew that if it happened in the particular way around himself, maybe it would not follow the same trajectory. Maybe the way that the teachings were needed to be dispersed and shared had to be very particularly in this way, rather than from the little reality in Banaras that he had created. Again, it's just understanding divine will is just a very hard thing. It doesn't follow the logic of our own minds. It only follows that intuitive attunement. And yet, we're like, we use logic so often just trying to figure out Ho kya rahe hai is dunya mein? And what he said and what he really wanted above all, he says over here, is to establish the brotherhood of man. And that's why Yogananda put, points out that when that bomb dropped, when we realize we have the power to destroy on such a vast scale, 
<laughs> he humorously puts it here, but it's a little bit of a warning. Lest the continued use of physical force banish all men along with their problems. Ki <laughs> problems to chale jayenge when we use the physical force, but we will also probably no longer be there to experience those problems at all. Though the human race and its works disappear tracelessly by time or bomb, the sun does not falter in its course. The stars keep their invariable vigil. Cosmic law cannot be stayed or changed, and man would do well to put himself in harmony with it. If the cosmos is against might, if the sun wars not with the planets, but retires at dewful time to give the stars their little sway, what avails our mailed fist? Shall any peace indeed come out of it? Not cruelty, but goodwill arms the universal sinews. A humanity at peace will know the endless fruits of victory, sweeter to the taste than any nurtured on the soil of blood. It's a beautiful visual for us to tune into, isn't it? The sun doesn't say, Ki bhai, I'm going to, you know, I'm more important and I am, look at me, I am the light. It quietly retires and allows darkness to set. It quietly allows the stars to have their moment, the moon to have its moment. And the entire universe just follows and allows both sides of reality to play out. We feel that we are right and others are wrong and therefore it's important for us to make sure that others know that they are wrong and let me show them by force because there's no other way people would hear me. And we don't even allow for light and darkness just to play its game out. We're so afraid of darkness, we think darkness is bad. Yet the sun doesn't think darkness is bad. The sun doesn't decide ki bhai light is more important and let me just stay longer and let there be less darkness therefore. And so when we see things that aren't quite right in the world, we're not in our own selves at ease like the sun is at ease. The sun doesn't feel ki if moon ko zada time mil gaya then people will forget about me. <laughs> You know, if the stars and people start making, you know, poems about the stars, then mere, you know, who will sing my glories? The sun doesn't particularly care about my himself or itself, but that's where our unease comes from. We think, whether as a nation, whether as a family, whether as an individual, whether as whatever, if we feel that we're right, then others have to be wrong. And that's the only way our rightness makes sense to us. And that's a scary process for us to contemplate. Our inability to let what's happening happen. And concentrating in our own self, in staying in the light as much as we are able to. But even when we, at times, kind of <laughs> move into darkness, even that has its purpose, just as we saw just as suffering had purpose in Sri Yukteswar's understanding of faith, similarly our dark moments show us all the more reason why we enjoy so much being in the light. The other day we were having, um, was it at the chai chat thing that we were doing? Where Abhijit, we were talking about how to stay, you know, really inspired and, uh, um, you know, what, do, what are the tools we use to inspire us to keep staying strong on the spiritual path and Abhijit said, well, it's when I'm not inspired and when my energy goes down, that's when I'm like, oh no, I don't want to experience this low state. That inspires me more often to put out energy than when things are good. In fact, when things are good, when the sun is shining, then though we want to be skipping out in the lawn, it's when darkness comes that we realize, wait a minute, you know, that's when we get introspective. That's when we start asking a little bit more pertinent questions. So we must use the darkness for what its purpose is, to then accept the light fully. But when light's shining, oftentimes we're not interested in the light. I don't know how much time we have. Do you have anything to add? Mm -hmm. All right, we'll just continue, see where we get. 
I, in fact, I actually want to jump up a little. Okay. Where are we? The broad sympathies and discerning insight needed for the healing of earthly woes cannot flow from a mere intellectual consideration of man's diversities, but from knowledge of man's soul unity with God. Toward realization of the world's highest goal, peace through brotherhood, may yoga, the science of personal contact with the divine, spread in time to all men in all lands. I want to point out over here, Master says, the world's highest ideal is peace through brotherhood. As an earth, as why earth was created, as why all of us exist on this planet, our planet's highest ideal is peace through brotherhood. When I read that, I, it just struck me as like, wow, that's a goal that we all should be working towards. That's an important goal to work towards because we loved separation so much. Ye religion alag hai, wo religion alag hai, ye caste alag hai, wo caste alag hai. This person looks different than me. And even though in intellectually in our mind and today even more so, you know, now even genders are changing and even, you know, all these things are just evolving in ways that can be fairly confusing for us. And intellectually we say, oh, diversity and unity and diversity. But in our minds, we don't really see that unity. We only see diversity. So if we're trying to create something at all outwardly, this would be a beautiful thing for us to be working on. Peace through brotherhood. To really connect with people that are different from us. To really feel that kinship with them. To make an effort, in fact, to reach out to people who don't uh, subscribe to the same thought patterns that we do, the same God that we worship, the same customs that we follow. And feel where that brotherhood, where in our heart is it hard for us to connect with people? Why is it so hard for us to connect with people that we deem different? And if our Guru is saying this is the world's highest ideal for this moment, for this reality, is this world trying to express itself, peace through brotherhood, it would be a kind of interesting thing. And that's why when Master and Swami thought of creating communities, was at least with this hope, could we, even like-minded people of us, come together and live in complete peace? Even that's so hard. Yeah. Can a family live in peace? How many issues do we have in our families? Can we, in our own consciousness, live in peace? How many issues do we have with our own selves? And so if just a like-minded group of people come together and they can't fully live in peace, it's going to be a hard thing for this world to experience and express that peace, isn't it? But that's the job given to us, at least by our Guru, to express in this life, in this particular way, to try to have that peace through brotherhood, to make that effort now to reach out just a little bit more to people, not just live in our own little shells. And that's what community is. It's not a shell. It's the practice of peace first with people. It's easy to practice peace with by, so that I can be stronger to practice peace when it's harder to practice peace with others. I'd like to close here unless you have closing remarks. No, just coming back to this chapter a little bit more, what's happening here. And this was a very interesting morning in the life of Yogananda because this is the first time that Sri Yuteshwar is giving him a specific assignment. I mean, after Sri Yuteshwar shares this story about his guru, Lahiri Mahashaya, he creates this amazing presence of Lahiri Mahashaya through the group of people he was around, surrounded by. I mean, he just shares this vibration and, and the whole balcony in that hermitage was so uplifted by the vibration of Lahiri Mahashaya. 
then he carries that vibration that he has generated, sends everyone else aside, and brings all this into Yogananda's awareness. And Yogananda was very open then. He was already feeling the grace of Lahiri Mahashaya through that story. And what Sri Yudeshwar does, he uses that openness that Yogananda was in and says, you have a responsibility. You have to write and share the teachings and the message of Lahiri Mahashaya. And he asks of this request after creating and bringing Yogananda into that space of Lahiri Mahashaya's miracle with Sri Yudeshwar. So this is a very important day in Yogananda's life because this is a request that Sri Yudeshwar has asked of him after many years on the path, after being um, for long years under Sri Yudeshwar's <coughs> training, and that morning when Yogananda was that open is when Sri Yudeshwar introduced that request. And it was fascinating that since then, uh, Yogananda said many times, from that morning, from that request, I knew I had the responsibility to collect information from Lahiri Mahashaya's disciples and then write about his true mission in the world and the role he had to play in our line of gurus. And in fact, we will read this later on, but in 1935, Yogananda comes back to India after vi being many years in the US, comes back to India to visit his guru, yes, but also to do a pilgrimage and to visit other saints and recollect information about Lahiri Mahashaya so he could write later on about his life and we will hear about Lahiri's life and all that we are reading is because Yogananda's mission of writing about uh, Lahiri's life. So I think this is not just a nice chapter but in this chapter uh, Yogananda received a specific a request from his guru and he fulfilled it. And thanks to that request, we know so much about Lahiri Mahashaya, his miracles, his wife, his children, and his encounter uh, with Babaji that very soon we'll read about. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing your Saturday noon with us and with Lahiri Mahashaya and with the masters. Wish you a fabulous day ahead. God bless you all. Jai, Jai Guru. Guru.